What's going on, everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? This is Kevin from the Chord Progression Podcast, brought to you by My Song of the Day Rock 2000 Day. Wishing you guys a happy Tuesday and letting you know that I am a couple of pounds lighter. Now, I'm a couple pounds lighter. I had my appendix taken out with emergency surgery the day before I shot this. So, yeah. If you see me squirming around during this podcast on the video, uh, that's just me trying to get comfortable because I got three incisions in my stomach. Uh, they made three small incisions. Not that big. I should be good to go in about a week. But, you know, just taking it a little bit slower one day at a time. But that's just for your little precursor kind of thing. I'm all right, though. Don't worry about it. But before we get into our episode, let me go through my shameless plugs. Of course, if I had any advertising, this would go. But I don't. So it's going to plug our stuff for my song today. So please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can watch the YouTube videos of our normal YouTube channel on our YouTube channel, along with the Core Progression Podcast videos. You can listen to the Core Progression Podcast also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. And yeah, we're just going to keep that one simple for right now. So we're going to jump right into it with our guests. So I'm going to swallow there a little bit, a little bit of tickling this in the throat. So about a week ago, this uh, person, her name is Alice from the band Atwood out of Italy, sends me a request that says, hey, we just released our new single called Ghost at the end of April, and I would like to know what you think of it. And I'm like, oh my God, someone values my opinion. This is great. So I thought, will I listen to it? Yes, I will. I listened to it and my thought process was this is not what I was expecting because this is the first time someone asked me to listen to music and review it was Hell Garden out of Brazil and they were a thrash metal band. I've gotten us a couple others here and there for that along with small band Saturday stuff and most time you know it's more hard rock, punk rock, metalcore, that kind of stuff. Well, this was not any of that. This was a lot more alternative rock, pop rock kind of style. So I listened to it and I was kind of thrown off by it. I gave her my thoughts on the song Ghost, but then I went a little bit deeper in their discography for Atwood and they had the song called Waves that was the thing that kind of was like, okay, this band is definitely not a band you can really put into a box. This isn't a band you can't really classify under a certain genre. This band is definitely something a lot more. So I wanted to, you know, have a chance to really dive deep into this. I wanted to talk to Alice about this stuff. So I asked her if she wanted to be on the Core Progression Podcast. And lo and behold, did I get on the Core Progression Podcast? Oh, yeah, you better believe I did. So coming from Milan, Italy, please welcome from the band Atwood, Alice, their lead singer. And are you guys ready? Because this one is a great one. So are you guys ready? Can I do it even with stitches in my stomach? Oh, yeah, I can. Let's go. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners of the Chord Progression Podcast. You guys know I always bring on special guests now because, well, that's always the best way to go about it. And, yeah, we definitely hit it on this one. So, a little backstory on the guest today. I believe it was sometime last week she reached out to me asking to take a look and listen to their most recent single called Ghost. I did, and I listened to some more of their music. I'm like, well, there's some stuff here that's definitely for me. And we talked a little bit, and I said, you know what? Let's see if we can get her on the podcast. And boom, it happened, and here she is today. So, all the way out of Italy from the band Atwood, please welcome Alice. Alice, welcome to the Core Progression Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me today. Well, thank you for being on. How are you today? I'm fine. It's extremely hot today in Italy. I don't know what's going on. Um, yeah. Is summer finally coming around, I guess? Yeah, but I'm not too excited about it. <laughs> oh, why not? I don't like summer. I don't like hot weather. I, I don't like sweating. I don't like the sun in general. <laughs> so... I'm going to say at some point, they're just going to have to start moving like further north, like go way, way up there, like as north in Norway as possible and just I live should. Live I there. probably should to be happy in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and you never know. Life could lead you anywhere. It, yeah. it could easily lead you up there. Or, you know, you could end up still end up in Italy. You, know, you never know. Anything could happen. I could, ju- I could stay in Italy and just move up in the mountains somewhere where just three people live and their sheep. And that's it. But... <laughs> Also, then you end up becoming like a sheep farmer, then a musician. Well, if I don't manage to get it to become a musician, a sheep farmer might be a good alternative. <laughs> I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> I mean, it, it wouldn't be bad. However, taking a look at your music and taking a look at how some of the like stats behind it, because of course I jumped into some of it where right now um, on Spotify, you're around 15,500 15, uh, streams per month yeah. of your music, which is 
got to say pretty good. I mean, I a lot of the bands I, I speak to were always like in that range right there. So it's like, okay, def- oh, shoot. I definitely just messed up something. And I definitely did mess up something. <laughs> what happened? I hit, I got to re-click something because, uh, well, for all you listen at home, it's not going to necessarily notice anything, but I definitely just stopped recording on the mixer and had to restart recording. So I always mess up once during this podcast and here it is. <laughs> That's what makes it authentic. So oh oh easily and <laughs> so so back on track we were talking about it was like fifteen thousand five hundred Spotify listeners monthly, and that's usually like a good metric to look at just because that just shows how many people are listening to your music and taking a look at some of the other places because always on Spotify you can see the top five cities that people are listening to your music. I saw cities like Los Angeles, Columbus, Ohio here in the United States, Miami, New York, mm-hmm. and then Hamburg, Germany. So it's I'm looking at it's like you've got some major points especially here in the united states and you've got the two biggest cities in the country then you've got a city in the southeastern most point of the country and then you've Mm -hmm. got a city like in the middle of the country and then you're and then germany so it's just your reach is definitely out there already yeah yeah we realize that we are we get the most appreciation outside of italy (laughs) so yeah the us germany the uk as well uh, but we're trying to push our music in Italy as well because, you know, it's where we're from. So it's important to grow a strong fan base in here as well. Uh, where exactly in Italy are you located? Uh, Milan, so in in the north. Okay, because I've talked to two other bands from Milan beforehand. And oh, really? Yeah, diff- definitely different style of music from you where one of the band was a metalcore band, one band's an alternative metal band, oh, and they're both okay. around the area. So I've talked to them and it's just... Every time I hear about the music scene, especially more northern Italy, it's like it's a little bit more towards like the more rock and metalish, barely. But if you go further south, it's just something that is not really conducive to that kind of music. Yeah, here in uh, in our region, we have a great underground scene for rock and metal. I think there's a gr- a whole deal of great bands. It's really really nice. You know, it's all it's also there's its pros and cons. <laughs> with this because if you want to become to become someone it gets harder because you have that many bands that are so great and you have to find a way to stand out but it's also really really nice to see that music is developing in such a positive way i really really like it and one thing too you always have to remember is when it comes to growing music and certain types of music in certain types of areas around the world, it's always going to start out with more of that underground scene where it's not going to be the most popular. Because when it comes to like, you know, hard rock, heavy metal or more alternative rock with Atwood style, it's not going to be something where, you know, they're just going to jump into a certain area and all of a sudden it's going to be big right away unless it's already big in that area. It's going to be something that's going to slowly grow and build. And as it slowly grows and as it slowly builds, eventually what's going to end up happening is you're going to end up getting something that's going to be awesome because that local scene, people are going to know about it locally, but then all of a sudden, you know, they're going to go to places like where, where that type of music is a lot bigger. I mean, Germany is probably your prime example of that, where especially anything more rock oriented is going to be a lot bigger. All of a sudden you're going to start, you know, maybe up sh- showing up there, playing some shows over there. People are going to be listening to more of your music over there and clubs are going to want you to come and play at their clubs over there just because, well, the people are asking for it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we have planned a tour of, of Germany for, I think, this summer. But, you know, with the whole pandemic thing going on. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we wanted to, to do a small tour of obviously a small tour because we are a small band, but we're of Germany and we were super excited because, uh, yeah, we, we realized that we, we have a bit of a grip in Germany. And so I think it would have been, it would have been a success for us uh, if we managed to go there, but we didn't. So we're going to try again next summer or whenever we can. I don't know. But yeah, starting off, starting off, starting off, sorry. It's <laughs> okay. Off more. Um, pays off oh yeah especially because one thing it's even with trying to build this whole entire thing for myself one thing I noticed about starting out small is but there's a couple things one 
everyone has to start out small. You're not just yeah. going to start with all of a sudden three million people following your stuff or listening to your music. It's not going to happen like that. Everyone starts out no matter what at zero. The second thing is, is as you start out small, especially with, you know, dealing with more of an underground scene in Milan in Northern Italy, what's going to happen is, is it, is it not, is it going to grow a lot slower than, you know, if you went with something that'd be more popular within that region? Of course it is. However, where the difference comes in is, when you're playing those shows, you're going to be meeting other bands that you're going to end up becoming good friends with. You're going to end up becoming closer with the people that are listening to your music. You're going to build these genuine and authentic connections with them. And yeah. building those types of connections is just going to end up growing your band more and more due to the fact that all of a sudden they're going to become so much bigger fans of your band. They're going to be talking to their friends about it. They're going to be talking online about it. And all yeah. of a sudden, next thing you know, people are listening to your music all over the world just because it was you know, someone mentioned it on a huge Reddit thread and it ended up becoming a hit. Yeah. And I think that getting there takes a lot of hard work. Uh, Starting small is what takes the hardest work because you have, you just have your music and yourself to promote and to to sell, but yeah, to promote. Mm -hmm. So, but I also think that it's the most genuine part of growing a band because then when you get not that I know what it feels like to be in a bigger band, but I only I can assume it when you get bigger than many other interests get taken into account. But when you're a smaller band, you can just focus on growing, like you said, on growing a strong fan base with people who you really click, you really can connect with. But it takes hard work. It takes a uh, Costin's con- Oh my God, <laughs> I can't speak today. I'm sorry. Oh, it is a okay. Oh. I mean, I told you about what happened with me yesterday. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah, simply it takes hard work, even though it's, it's really fun and uh, you get really, really a good satisfaction from it. I think. Well, it's, it's gonna be something where you're gonna get good satisfaction from it if that's what you want to do. And if if you're building, if you're building your band, you're building on your music, you're trying to build your audience and it's growing slowly. But every time you create a genuine connection with a, with a fan or with another band and you're feeling, I would say, happy, elated or just like really inspired just because all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're building something for yourself and you're doing it yeah. and doing it the way that you want to do it. That's just going to end up keeping you going more and more and more and just end up being proud of what you're doing because you're going to be happy with what you're doing. That's the best way to describe it. Yeah. You have a genuine interest in what you're doing. So you, you don't think of profits. You don't think of interests. You only think of what you like to do and how much you want it to become your future. So it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause if you were just in it, just like, Oh, why are you like, why, if it was something where, you know, why are you making music? Oh, I just want to do this to make money. Well, you're not going to be happy with what you're doing. Even if you end up being successful, you're not going to be happy with what you're doing if you don't like it. But if yeah. it's something that you're building for yourself and this is what you want to do, then any amount of success, whether it's immense success where all of a sudden, you know, you're touring and you're going all over the world, or if it's something as small as creating a genuine connection with one fan, you're going to feel just as excited no matter what. And you're going to end yeah. up going to bed at night, always being happy with what you've done, with who you are and where you're going. Yeah, it just takes that single person to come to you after one after your show and tell you, you know, I, I never heard you before, but I loved your show. I loved your set. Your songs really, really meant something to me. Uh, and you go, you can you can go home and say, oh, so I, I touched someone today. I, I managed to deliver a message to, get it, to deliver my emotion faithfully. So I'm OK. I'm happy with that. Yeah, have you ever had an instance <laughs> like success to me? Yeah. I was going to say, have you ever had an instance like that where a fan came up and just was like, I never heard you before, but I heard you for the first time today and just had this whole entire maybe epiphany experience where they're open <laughs> to your music and they just had this whole sudden realization of how much they really like your music, how much a band could just impact them right away from the first time just seeing them? Yeah, it happened a couple of times and uh, it, it really touched me because, you know, when you play, there's, there's always someone coming up to you and telling you, oh, you know, you were great. You were very, very good. And you're like, oh, okay, thanks. I'm happy to know that you like our show. But then there's that person that comes to you and tells you, you know, I, I, I discovered a great band today, thanks to you. And, and then you realize that's why you're playing. Because there's, there's people who don't 
who don't necessarily have to know that you're famous, that you're successful. They just have to listen to your music and decide that they love you. And you can be like this, you can be like this, but they're going to love you and support you no matter what. So it's it gives me faith in people and in music because uh, it's really, I just think it's really wholesome. Oh, it easily is. And then coming from the fans perspective on that as well, just because, I mean, that is my whole entire perspective is as the fan, because, mm-hmm. well, I haven't really played a musical instrument since I was 14 and I can't really remember how to play anything or I've okay. never, and still I look at a guitar. I'm like, how does this even work? <laughs> but listening to it, it's just, there's always a certain bands where I'm listening to them and all of a sudden it's just, you get the certain feel all the time, no matter what, whether whether it's just a certain song or the way they sound. Because, I mean, I had something similar happen the first time I got to see a band called Ice Nine Kills, where it was just like, I didn't want to go to their show just because I was working all day. I bought a ticket. I'm like, but I still want to go. I just wasn't feeling up to it. Mm-hmm. I had people, I basically it was like, my mom was like, you have to go because I had to work out of their house that day. And she's like, you've been talking about this concert for weeks, so you should definitely go. I'm like, okay, I'll go. And it was a concert where it was just like, from that moment, it was, I heard some of the band's music, but I never really was like, I'm like, okay, they're good, but I just don't mm-hmm. really not sure how I feel about them. So their live show and after that I was hooked right away. Yeah. I was like, huh? Okay. Nope. And I can imagine Ice Nine Ice Nine Kills put up quite a bit of a show. I've never seen them live, but I don't well, the, know. Their whole entire idea, especially after their last album, was every song was based off of a famous horror movie. Yeah. So their show was all based around that. Okay. And it was just okay, that creeps rude. me out a bit because I'm not the biggest fan of horror movies. <laughs> I'm easily scared, so. <laughs> well, I mean, they killed the same person on stage about six times, so. Okay, great. <laughs> but it's it, but it was it was just so much fun to be there because it was no matter what if I was watching the show or if I was kind of it just like trying to find a space to just you know look at this watch the stage watch a show or if I was in the somewhere in the, on this like in the crowd where all of a sudden it's like the people are so packed together you're kind of pushing together or in the mosh pit just you know hitting people and getting hit at the same time it didn't matter where I was I was just so happy I was like yeah. this is awesome didn't matter where I was, I was having a great time no matter what, but it's like just kind of talking about how when you have fans come up to you after shows and just really feel like they resonate incredibly well with your music and instantly became a fan right then and there. It's, I have, I, I've, I've dealt with something like that from, you know, the other side as the fan mm-hmm. perspective It's just like, Oh my God. And just the feeling as a fan that you get off of that is incredible as well, because yeah. now you discovered a new band that you absolutely love. You discovered this music that all of a sudden you're going to end up listening to it. And every time you listen to it, you're going to potentially feel just as good as you did the first time you ever saw the band mm-hmm. play live. It's really something that you can be having the worst day possible. You listen to music and it's just, you know, this is working out just fine. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's the most important thing about music, really. It's just, uh, it's human connection. No one plays music for themselves. Well, you know, you do, you do play music for yourself because you like it, obviously. But you need someone to listen to it. Otherwise, is it even music? I don't know. And and finding someone who likes it, you know, it's, it's a big satisfaction. <laughs> Well, when it comes to music as well, especially when I'm listening to music and the artists are always putting in their heart and soul into it. And you can really tell when they do that as well. And it, they get real personal with it. And they just talk. It's basically trying to tell a whole entire story about when they went through a horrible time in their life or when something wasn't going right. And mm-hmm. they get real personal with it. One thing I've seen is a lot of those times when they do those songs, they end up becoming the most popular. And I think the reason is because as a fan, when you're listening to that song, you're hearing them open up, you're hearing them be more personal and you end up getting this connection through that because maybe you want something just as similar or you can make a connection with it. And as I like to say, it is when you're trying to describe how that felt to somebody, it might be really hard to describe, but then all of a sudden this song comes out where the message is behind it and the sound just really connects with it and kind of puts a tangible feeling or a tangible explanation to that yeah. feeling. So when like, if you're writing music where you're talking about something that's a really personal to you, then could easily be helpful for you because now you're putting something more personal in there. Yeah. And if even if you're dealing with it right at that moment, it's helping you deal with it and understand that time in your life. And then as a fan, if they're listening to that, it's just maybe re- again, resonating with something that happened in their lives as well. And then that connection is there just because they have something that describes that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's uh, that's true. That's what I try to do whenever I write my lyrics. I always put my whole heart into them. But then I also try to um, to mold them into something that can be meaningful to someone else. Because I know that my music, our music, is going to be um, listened by other people. So uh, I want my message to be pretty accessible to, to everyone. So... Um, Telling my story, but ma- but making it possible for other people to to embrace it is really really important to me and to us as a band in general. Um, so that's why we put the lyrics last. We write the music, we write everything, and then we put the lyrics on top, just to, just so that we make we can make sure that everything fits, everything is balanced properly. So. Um, that nothing overpowers anything. And because the lyrics are important, of course, from a singer point of view, they're <laughs> crucial, but the, the instrumental is extremely important as well. So it, may, it makes for, I don't know how to say, it just, um, it just enhances lyrics and vice versa though. So I think it's really hard to create a good balance. And I'm not saying that we managed to do it, but we did our best to do it. And when a band tries tries and probably succeeds in doing that, I think that people can definitely hear it. They can feel it. They can feel a difference between a song written just to get somewhere and a song written because the people writing it felt something and decided to deliver the message of what they, they were feeling. So it's important. <laughs> oh, as a, as a fan, I'm, I definitely can understand that where we are talking about how when people are making music, if it's either just to make it to get somewhere or make it where it's something that's super duper genuine and really trying to tell a story that happened with something in their life or something that's really important to them. As a listener, you can really tell when that's coming through in their music just because it's, and I, and the, vo- the vocalist is pretty much the most key part of this because there's always a certain emotion that you can feel when you're listening to it, where there are times where I listen to music and it's like, was this really that inspiring or was this something to just kind of try and be popular mm-hmm. and try and, you know, maybe be a hit on the radio, get a lot of people listen to it, get some money, more money off of it. If that was the case, there's something like I can listen to it. I can pretty much tell just because. I've heard, especially with a band that has a more material behind them, because you can go back and listen to some of their other material. And if there was something that seemed a lot more genuine, a lot more personal for them, it's just the emotion in their voice, no matter what they're going with, whether if, you know, for something more metal or metalcore with those, with screaming, like the unclean screams, if they're just real rough and powerful, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, then there was definitely something going on there. Or then you're listening to someone who's doing more clean vocals as well across any certain genre. And you just hear this difference in their voice from something that's a little bit more, you know, oh, maybe I'm trying to do something more commercial or something that's a lot more personal. You can definitely hear a little bit of a difference in there Mm -hmm. and it sticks out incredibly when you're listening to both of those, like an example of one or the other, you'll see them back to back. It just stands out. So, and when listening to your music as well, because I remember I mentioned something about when after listening, I was like, you kind of have this, a feeling when I listened to it, that was very similar to uh, Sharon Dunadel of Within Temptation. Mm-hmm. Like there's a certain feeling behind it with your vocals that just kind of drew me right there. And listening to a bunch of Within Temptation stuff, I'm not sure how to exactly describe it because with yeah, when it comes... I, I want to dig deeper into that <laughs> because nobody's ever told me that. And I, I want to know why. I find it really <laughs> interesting because some... <laughs> Most of the time, people tell me, oh, you know, you remind me of Emily of Oh, okay, thank you. I mean, I think it's yeah. a compliment because I love her so much, but I just I just can't see it. I don't know why. And with, with the temptation, it's even harder for me. So explain. Okay, I know. I'm taking, I'm taking a look. I'm like, because I know I definitely wrote this down when I was listening to a couple of your songs. I wanted to go okay. deep dive into them. And always when I go deep into songs, I always take a look at how the construction and the composition, the instrumentation of the whole song are put together because mm-hmm. that's important. But then the vocal performance is always like one of the things where you're always going to end up being focused on if it's there just because yeah. – that's what you're really that's what you're really listening that's one thing that people are really listening to that's so the curse of the singers really <laughs> yeah so i was going through and i'm like i definitely wanted to find it so i put for this one from uh on your song waves which is probably my favorite song that uh i listened to uh-huh. from 
uh, from Atwood. And I was like, I thought that they were your best overall from the three songs I seen was on Waves because it had a hint of Sharon Dendell and Temptation. I called it the cinematic vocal style. Okay. Where it was like, when I'm listening to someone like Sharon Dendell or Amy Lee from Evanescence, they have that, they have a style where it's both, I called it cinematic and angelic, where it's like they have this f- 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 feeling where it's just something that's powerful where it's like you put it over a movie soundtrack and it's going to be the thing that you just notice the most like in a mm-hmm. movie kind of like kind of like a James Bond movie every time during the okay. opening credit sequence when they have some kind of like they always they always play a whole song during the opening credit sequence yeah. I mean it's been going on ever since they've been doing James Bond movies since the 1960s mm-hmm. but it's just something that like would fit in there it's just with a powerful vocal most of the time it's a female vocalist now so it's incredibly powerful and it just stands out so much and it just hits mm-hmm. you hard Okay. But that's where I was kind of making the comparison with Sharon and Adele with Within Temptation. Mm-hmm. It's just that feeling that it's just it sticks out. It's not necessarily as angelic as them where it's, you know, more prophetic and just kind of more that I got to put more like that oh, kind of feel <laughs> where I kind of like Sharon and and Amy Lee have. But it's just the cinematic feel overall. And even on your song, uh, Dance in the Sun, I I, it again, it reminded me of that as well, because as I wrote for that one, it was using that cinematic style of your vocal allows you to be to like drive off the power that the style of that song brings. So when you kind of mix that all together, it just sounded something that your vocal was definitely, in my opinion, like the most powerful part of that song. But it just worked so well together that the cinematic feeling, just the power behind it was really what made the connection between your vocals and Sharon and Adele within Temptation. OK. OK. I, I, great explanation, by the way. So I, I, re, I really liked it. I, I, no one has ever told me that my voice was like cinematic or, or and now, now that you've told me, I think I might use it as a, I think I may develop it. Not being conscious of this thing. I might use it whenever I feel like I might implement it or remove it whenever whenever I feel like. So it's food for thought. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. And it's something that, you know, if, if you're going to use it more, use it less, that's all going to be up to a couple of things. It's first off, it's what you want to do with it, because yeah. if you want to use it, great, go for it. If that's, if you feel like, you know, I don't want to use it, that's fine too. Cause it's your music. It's what you want to create. Uh, another thing too is, is especially cause as you're talking about with writing, you write, out the whole entire song and then you write the lyrics and you put the vocals on top of it as well. And so that's kind of like the last piece behind it. One thing you can always do is, is however the instrumentation on the song is constructed, you can kind of get a feel of how the song is going to go and you can use your vocals to, you can use that to basically guide your vocals into, okay, maybe I'm going to go with something a little bit softer, a little bit more that maybe I'm going to go with on this part, a little bit more that cinematic feel. Just listen to what the song is calling for because a lot of times when you I feel like when artists listen to what the song is calling for, whether it's like, OK, the vocals are doing one thing and the instrumentation is just following suit and just building it up or flip it up, flip it around. Where all of a sudden the instrumentation is a thing that just starts out and it's powerful. And all mm-hmm. of a sudden the vocals behind it just match that power and just amplify it. It just yeah. works. In contrast, it can work sometimes as well, where all of a sudden it's two completely different things that can work, but that's also a lot harder to do. And I don't yeah. really think there's a lot of bands that can pull that off where all of a sudden you're going hard and all this, like going hard with some like insane, you know, metalcore instrumentation and you do these really calm vocals on top of it. Sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I personally prefer to, to let the music drive me because I think it's for me, at least on a personal level, it's a lot easier. Uh, to work around the music instead of creating lyrics uh, and uh, a vocal line out of nowhere and then adding music afterwards. So, um, yeah, I think everybody has their own opinion on this one. But we like, we, we write the music together and then uh, we also work on um, on vocals together. But of course, the main input is mine because I, I'm a singer, obviously. <laughs> But we like to work on everything together simply because uh, it's many points of view. Uh, because I think the one single person after a while always tends to do the same thing over and over again. Unless you're like Beyonce, so you can do everything. <laughs> and, and that's okay. If, if you're like Beyonce, I'm very happy for you. And I envy you a lot. <laughs> but, you know, everybody has their own limits. Everybody has their own, their own taste in music. So 
my own taste in music tend, drives me to do after a while the same thing over and over again. And having other people telling me, oh, you know, you could do that there. You could, you could do this instead of that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, no, I don't like it. Why do I have to do that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, try, just try. And then it turns out to be, to be perfect. For example, the, um, the chorus of Dance in the Sun, um, Daniele, our guitar player, had the idea for it then of course i sang it and i and i made a few changes but the main vocals uh, he created so probably we needed his point of view on that part and implementing other people's ideas is really important in a band and i always try to do that i don't know if i manage to every time (laughs) i try I don't like to be the singer or we in general we don't like to be like I'm the singer so I'm always going to I'm I'm only going to do the singing I'm the guitar player I'm only going to do the guitar playing sorry nothing else that's not how a band works to me <laughs> so oh and not really any other band would work even like that just because if it's like okay, I'm gonna write. I, I've I've seen songs in specific instances where it's like okay, the drummer wrote their part, the guitarist just wrote their part, the bass player wrote their part, and the vocalist wrote their part. There's very few. I've, I know one instance of a song where that ended up happening, and the song came together, and it was fantastic. But most of the time, it's it's helpful when as a band you're writing the whole entire thing together due yeah. to the fact that okay, now we're gonna write this whole entire thing together. We'll see what happens, and after you do that, what's gonna end up happening is. Everyone in the band has different influences. Yeah. So I'm going to like at, kind of going to go on with this because I do. I've talked about this a couple other times, but it's a I think it's a it's a theory of mine, but I think it's absolutely correct where. So I, I'm going to start out with this when it comes to your influences. So when you're listening to music, what type of music do you normally like to listen to? And where do your influences really lie? Uh, when I was younger, I used to listen to a lot of new metal. So I had uh, Linkin Park. I had Korn. I, I listened to quite a a lot of evanescence so you can feel it in my voice today right now i'm i'm more of the yeah i'd say all the gen part a bit of prog metal uh yeah that uh but also your beyonce your rihanna your ariana grande because they're great vocalists and they're they're just extremely inspirational. While Daniele is a bit more on the postal core thing, so bands like Hands Like Houses, we draw a lot of inspiration from Paris, which is his favorite band. Okay. Really, so they, they really are geniuses. Whatever they do, it's incredible. But, you know, I, I'm like the metal head of the band, and he's more like the, the most pop side of the band. And I think that creates a good balance between the pop side uh, and the most ag- aggressive side um, okay because yeah. the reason i was going to bring that up and why i wanted to he- hear were both your influences and your guitar player's influence like, what was his what was his name again because i just don't want to mess it up daniele daniele okay so when you're bringing in both those style when you're bringing in all those different influences and all those styles and you're coming together to write a song or write any or an album or write your music whatever it might be that you're writing what's going to end up happening is is as long as you're writing together you're going to potentially notice some things that you might not notice beforehand. And it's going to prevent you from having what you're talking about, where you're writing the same thing or doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the reason is because everyone's bringing all these different influences to the table. Everyone's bringing all these different ideas where all of a sudden when it comes to something, it's more post-hardcore, something that's more alternative rock, something that's more pop rock, where how these songs are built and how these songs are constructed, there might be a certain pattern that really works on these specific instances. And then when you're coming in with more, you know, more of like a heavier set, maybe more new metal, more, uh, Lincoln Park, more corn, more Evanescence style. And then, you know, or maybe something that's a little bit more with those just straight pop vocalists like Ariana Grande, Rihanna, Beyonce. You have ideas from what they did and you kind of bringing those certain ideas to the table and you're kind of trying to combine songs. And even if you're writing something that's more post hardcore, something that's more pop rock, something that's more alternative rock, but you're going to bring in a certain aspect of a certain, you know, different style. And I think Wave's a perfect example of that. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But when you do that, what's going to end up happening is you're going to potentially end up noticing something where, Oh, maybe this, if I mix this and this, this might work out just the way I want it to. And all of a sudden it works. And the fact that you have two different people working on something with two completely different influences, someone's going to notice something that the other doesn't. Yeah. And 
because I got to use Waves as the perfect example of this because the like the intro for that song, it had this lighter style guitar, but it was mixed with this a lot heavier drumming. There was a good amount of like a rapid pace, had a couple of rapid double kicks in there. But what I liked about it was it wasn't like something that was super consistent where it wasn't like double kicks just going straight through the whole entire time. Like something yeah, on like... Uh, I despise double kicks going on the entire time. I really <laughs> cannot stand them. So <laughs> I would have been, no, no, yeah. remove everything, please. <laughs> well, because what I was going to use an example was like one where like, for, especially for like an intro where the double kicks are just super consistent in the intro throughout the whole entire thing. And then once the first verse starts, it changes up a little bit. Yeah. There's a song called The Signal Fire by Kill Switch Engage. We're mm-hmm. listening to the oh, intro. Yeah. I mean, it just goes hard throughout the whole intro. And then all of a sudden the vocals come in and they change up it, but they bring that rapid double kick in throughout most of the song but what you guys did on this one was it was a lot more of a, a lot more burst back and forth where it was like double kick and then stop it was like something like that and i even put in my little notes here it's like i like this because it gives the song more of that rock feel for someone like me but also allows the band to keep more of that you know letter and alternative side that they're kind of more based on that you know your guitar yeah. player really kind of fits in so i love how the whole entire thing mixed together a lighter guitar style to kind of bring that in but then also yeah. the a heavier style on the drums where i'm just like okay this is definitely where i'm going for this one like this is the type of song where it's like especially for someone that likes more of the harder style more of that punk rock style hard rock metal metalcore style from something from Atwood, I'm like, yes, this is definitely the kind of song that I'm gravitating towards. Yeah. We draw a lot of inspiration for for drums from metalcore and the heavier stuff because uh, pop drums are really fun, but sometimes they can be a bit, um, a bit repetitive. Mm-hmm. And so in ways, but throughout our all our songs, uh, when, when writing the drums, uh, we were together and like, hmm, that snare, move it there, mm, move it there, the bass drum, move it there. And so it, it, gets, uh, it gets a bit more interesting because, uh, you know, you write your basic pattern, then you say, okay, let's move this up. Let's change everything. Let's put the snare here. Let's put the hi-hat there. And it gets hard to play. <laughs> so our drummers have always been, have always had a hard time playing uh, our songs because we wrote the drums <laughs> and we're not drummers. But, you know, uh, we were, we've always been told that drums are what makes the, a difference in our music. And I re- I'm really proud of that, to be honest. So that goes back to what you were saying just before, that influences create... Uh, sorry, mixing many influences yeah. <laughs> just create good balance and allows you to create something more interesting, more something that can appeal to many different people. It can appeal to the metal head because the drumming is a bit more metal. It can appeal to the to the pop guy because, you know, right there, take dance in the sun, the vocals are a bit more pop than the other songs. So that could appeal to them as well. And, I think that that's important. If um, I think that's important because you manage to to get in touch with more people, mm, not in a success like way, in a success like way, yeah, okay. but mm, simply because you manage to to deliver your message to as many people as possible, and to me that is important. Yeah, and when when you think about it too. There are a couple instances you could, a couple different routes you could go with that. Where it's there are bands where it's okay, they have a certain style, they have a certain way they want to go about making their music, and they really want to stick within maybe the same genre throughout the whole entire yeah. the whole entire time of their career. Now, don't get me wrong, that is absolutely fine. It it, yeah, it can work out that way because if that's something you really feel strong on, and that's where you really where if as a musician you want to make your music, absolutely go for it. I mean, if if anyone tells you any different. Then it's like, well, it's it's your music. It's the way you want to create it. So just you know, keep creating it the way you want to create because that's where you're going to get the best music from. Yeah. Or you can go on the flip side of that, where it's you want to write music where you have you know where basically I always look at it as I say your core, where it's like your core sound is always going to be there. So you're going yeah. to always be able to tell you know like oh I'm listening to this song and there's a specific attribute of the band where it's like okay I know it's that band however you're able to play within so many different subgenres of rock and metal or whatever it might be that you're in even you know putting some other influences from other just other genres all out of nowhere and you're able to play around so much more you're able to get you're able to 
reach more people sure someone's not getting you know be like oh i like them because they're just this one kind of style and that's the kind of style i like it's you're gonna find something where like even for me after listening to your music there were some songs where i'm like i'm not the biggest fan of these songs but then again that's just because what i really like when i listen to music it just didn't resonate with me it's not i'm not saying in any way that you know it's bad at all it's yeah, just or- i'm being completely honest where it's like yeah I can see where the song easily has potential for a lot of people, but for me, it's just not the one I want to listen to. Then yeah, it was like when has I their own taste, and it's just perfectly legit. So, oh yeah, very much so. And then I jumped over to waves. I'm like, okay, this is something that's definitely more my speed. So I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. let's let's. I want to listen to this. Want to see where this one goes. And pretty much after listening to waves, that was the one that I'm like, okay, let's see if we can get Alicia on the podcast. Let's see if we can do this because that was the one that pretty much set it up for me. I'm like, that's it. We're doing it. <laughs> Yeah, Waves is the song that many metalheads prefer when when listening to our music. And I can see why. I mean, I easily can see why. Uh, I think it's one of the first, if not the first song we we worked on. So we just thought, okay, this this one needs to slap. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And we kept it that way. But then again, it's listening to some of the other stuff too, like with uh, Dance in the Sun, it was something that had more of that, how did I put it? Because like, it was kind of like how your newest single, Ghost Sound, which we'll get into in a little bit, because that is the latest single that uh, Atwood came out with. So I want to jump more into that specifically mm-hmm. so that, well, everyone listening, it's like, you know, hey, go check it out kind of thing. If, yeah. <laughs> and we'll really go deep into it. But listening to like Dance in the Sun, I was l- going through it and... I thought of it was like ghost, but the, especially the way the instrumentation sounds, because it had this more of like electronic in that synth style to it. it was like, you know, synthesizer style to it. It took it more into account and create more of like a pop rock track where I thought like this is a song where if you're playing it in a, in a, in like a, in like a, like a show, like live show, like a club, like there are people going to be dancing the song, like, you know, just kind of yeah. fr- like more, not like, you know, dancing, like, you know, how I would do it a normal show, like trying to run into people, just trying to see how many people you can put on the ground. So he was trying to put me on the ground, just have a good time doing yeah. it, but more just like really getting people going to that more that like pop rock kind of dance where it's just mm-hmm. kind of just letting all their inhibitions go to the wind and just enjoying life yeah. and just basically jamming out to the music the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. What, when listening to Dance in the Sun, we want people to dance as if they were out in a field in the sun. So, you know, that's what the that's what we wanted it to do. So, I, I think we managed. I, I mean, l- looking at it, I think you definitely hit on it. And I even wrote, wrote on this for because again, I always write my notes after this because I want to make sure I you know don't forget. Yeah. I put in there while this is a style that just doesn't hit me particularly all too well. One thing for the instrumentation that really stuck out to me was the drum fills that transition between different parts of the song. So all of a sudden you're gonna put a drum fill to transition between like the verse and the chorus or mm-hmm. like the chorus and the bridge or something like that. And they had this like like you had like a great like quicker style to them. And while they weren't as hard as you know something that I normally listen to or prefer, yeah. I thought they worked completely well within the song because it just drove the change in energy that would just not be there if they weren't there. So anytime you need to like potentially change a little bit of the energy in the song, you had a drum fill that went into the next part mm-hmm. of the song. And it just yeah. like kind of like that dance in the sun feel. Yeah, it just really drove every part of that to build up to it. And also the next part of the song yeah. comes, it's going to potentially get like a different style of, mm-hmm. you know, crowd that's going to end up dancing to it every time you transition. Like all of a sudden they're going to be doing one thing, you transition, now they're going to be doing another thing. But it's just that drum fill just drove the energy transition between the yeah. song every step of the way. And when I listen to that, I'm just like, oh, wow, how did they come up with that? <laughs> yeah, the drumming is is really the core of dance in the sun. Not the vocals, not the guitars, not the synths. I think it really is the drums. It just uh, we we really spend a great deal of time creating those drums and choosing the right sound of the drums because we we knew that it was it's the element driving the song. It really is crucial. So whenever we play it live. Um, you can see whenever we play live, there's people coming up to us and telling us, oh, you know, Dancing in the Sun sounds really good live. I didn't think that. I, I, I didn't think so. Why? Uh, no, you know, um, when you play live, the drums really stand out. They really create the groove, the, the energy. And we are just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. But yeah, they're just the core of it. it, it, it they're what drives the song. And I think it's strange because usually it's the vocals, it's 
mm, I don't know, the scenes. Mm. But with this one, it's the drums. Yeah, but when you're able to have something where all of a sudden the drums are going to drive the song and not just be the backbeat of the song and just be there to kind of keep the time, but when they're the driving factor behind it, there's not a lot of bands that do that. So when people listen to it and they really kind of hone in on that, it's something that's going to be more unique to what you're doing. And that's going to stand out more in the minds of fans just because on two accounts, one, it's not something they're used to, but two, it's also really freaking good. Yeah. Yeah, people are just used to to vocals being the focus of everything. And that gets a bit boring after a while. Even for me, I mean, I'm the singer. I like it when people come up to me and tell me, oh, you know, I, I really, really loved how you sang, I don't know, that's in a sound like Mira. Okay, thank you. But not that I don't appreciate it, because I do appreciate it, of course. It's, uh, it's, become, the, it's become normal, you know. It's, mm-hmm. it's the basis on which you create I wouldn't say just pop music. Now it's the, it's just the, the pain music revolves around. You, if you have good vocals, you're good to go. I, I, I would want it to be that way. I, I, I want our music mm-hmm. to be just as good. If you remove my vocals, I want something to catch your attention in any way. Uh, and I think any band should have that element and, because it's just you just can't expect the vocals to do it all for you oh i think you're absolutely correct on that 100 percent. i love the way you kind of put it where it seems like more especially today especially with the music that's more popular all over the place it's the vocals are the most instrumental point and over and of course the vocals can be the most instrumental point on average yeah just because that's what a lot of people are drawn to however if that's going to be the only thing that's really drawing people into it it's eventually it's just it's going to kind of get stale. And I think a great example of that is a band like, uh, and I did during my album reviews this year, I did kind of call them out for this. It was in this moment because mm-hmm. on their most recent album is something, there was something on the album that I really didn't like. And it was just every single song on that was so primarily focused on Maria Brink's vocals. Mm-hmm. While I have to give Maria Brink a lot of credit because her vocals are something that are inc- incredibly unique, just with the yeah, kind she, of like gothic power. But when you're listening to some of the older stuff that in uh, in this moment had done where the instrumentation was so much more mixed into it, I thought that was a lot better. But then during what they did on their most recent album, Mother, it was so much more focused on her vocals that it was like every song was like, OK, it's again, folks, I'm Maria Brink, folks, I'm Maria Brink. It's it does. I'm like the focus can be there, but I just wanted to see more of an instrumentation mix yeah. in there when and again, that's the easy way. Yeah. And then again, that's, I mean, that's, I'm just using them as an example because I think it's a very good example for, especially this year specifically, because they did come out with a new album. Have I heard other bands that have tried to do that? Yes, I have, but that's just the one that kind of sticks out in my mind right away. However, listening to your music as well, again, it's something where your vocals, especially with when I thought of them as more like Sharon Denadel with the cinematic style to them. Yeah, they did stand out incredibly. However, again, bringing up waves, bringing up Dance in the Sun, where it's especially with waves where the intro, just the that more the uh, rapid double kick burst from the drums just stood out right away. It's just like, oh, wow. OK. And then the <laughs> drum fills to transition through everything with Dance in the Sun. Those stuck out so much as well, where it's I did like what you say. It's like if you took out your vocals, would there be anything in the song that still really sticks out overall? And I got to say for both of those, absolutely. Like it stuck out real well. And it's something where. <laughs> It was the drums that stuck out. It wasn't them where, you know, on other, like I'd say classic, you know, more classic rock bands like the 70s and the 80s, like ACDC or Van Halen or Motley Crue, where like, you know, the guitar parts are going to stick out. Yeah. I mean, Van Halen and ACDC are perfect for that. Or something where all of a sudden, you know, something else is going to stick out. It's no, it's the, or like it's more of like a synthesizer kind of feel. No, it's the drumming that stuck out. And especially for the fact that you guys are writing the drumming and you're not drummers. And that's the thing that's sticking out. I mean, that's just a testament to your your writing style and how effective it is. I think our drums stick out because we're not drummers. So we don't know the rules of drumming. We just write what sounds good to us. Then, of course, a drummer can tell us, OK, I can play this thing. I, I need three hands to play this. So we need to change something. That's OK, of course. But we're... Not, know, not knowing the rules sometimes can help in creating something. 
a bit more unique. I'm not saying our drumming is unique, our music is unique, because there's so many good bands out there that it's just impossible to be unique. But uh, it helps. It helps to create something personal. Let's say personal, yeah. And I hope we manage to do the same thing with ghosts, because uh, if you remove my vocals, in my opinion, you could stay focused on all the synths, all the different sounds and elements. The main synth, I love it. It's just so, it's just raw, so big. I don't know. I love that kind of synth. They're just my favorite. But if you remove my vocals, did you notice something in particular? Um, it's from ghosts? Yeah. Yeah, and I do have to agree, and I do have to agree with you where it was the synth that I recognized right away, where it was something where again, Ghost, it had more of that more it had more of like an alternative rock, pop rock kind of feel. Where again, that's something you know I'm gonna be a little bit more removed from just because that's not necessarily what I like. But again, when I was listening to it, when it was coming up, if I remove if you completely remove your vocals, the synth was gonna be the thing that stuck out. Yeah. And when I was listening to it from the way it was constructed listening to the verses because all of a sudden you guys were getting into it and all of a sudden the verses come in and it kind of was like, you kind of removed a lot of things from behind it as well, especially in the instrumentation. And it was, it kind of caught me off guard, especially because it reminded me of something that, you know, uh, what's her name? Billie Eilish was kind of working mm-hmm. with lately where it's just all of a sudden you brought in this thing where it's all of a sudden the everything's kind of stripped back, but it's still kind of got a, you know, this, is just completely different feel to it overall. And I got to, cause I got to pulled up right here and I was like, it was that Billy Eilish comparison, especially with the styling and the verses really came in hard because there was less of an overall backing instrumentation, but it was much more based on that synth sound electronic style. And also kind of how you use your vocals as well, because it wasn't something that was super cinematic. It wasn't something that was super drawn out. It was something that was a little bit more chopped up. So it was mm-hmm. like a little bit, it was like kind of like quick hits here and there. And, I can see easily why, you know, playing around with that style would be something that you want to give a shot at just because, you know, it's something that is a little bit different. It's something that is not going to be necessarily mixed in with a lot of other things, especially right now because it's more of a new thing. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden playing with it, it just really kind of looked at it. I can look at it. I'm like, this is something that people can really get into, especially because, again, it's it's two things. One, it's something that people are kind of getting into more now. But the second thing is, is it, it's not, it doesn't sound like, you know, throughout the whole song, it's not like, oh, you're trying to do something that's just this style. Listening to the ver- the chorus as well, because then you completely change it up where all of a sudden it had more of this. It was, it reminded me more like a pop and alt rock mix style. It was catchy. It was a lot lighter and it flowed really nice. Had some pace and some energy behind it. They really kind of had more of that like classic, like dancing in a club kind of feel to it. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't something that was like, oh, we're going to try this and just we're trying to see if we can do a whole song off this. It's like, we're going to put this in here, but we're going to see how this turns out with the rest of our music and yeah. see how it all comes together. Yeah, that's what we tried to do. We wanted to, with Ghost, we wanted to give a shot at contrast, basically. So yeah, we, we took the, the uh, verse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on today. I really can I can't hey, remember words. Hey, d- don't don't worry. Um, I mean, I I already accidentally stopped the recording for like five seconds at one point, so I think you're in the clear already. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. So we 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 tried it. We ju- we just thought, what if we move? What if we remove everything? What if we leave this? electronic element and the voice and what we all, we also tried to do was what happens if we have different vocals on this song the, uh, I if you don't give me any rules I like to sing uh, wide open I like uh, good melodies I like uh, flowing melodies that's the evanescence part coming in yeah but I also like to be faced with challenges as a singer and finding the right melody for ghost was not easy because I was always trying to get into a nice flowing melody. Uh, but we wanted to try something different. So we came up with this, uh, with the verse where, you know, yeah, there's a melody, but it's not that defined. It's, I wouldn't say it's a, it's spoken, but it's also not sung fully. I think, uh, but then after implementing that style of singing, we realized, okay, but now we need an, a nice open chorus. So what do we do now? 
and we managed i think we managed to create a good again a good balance uh, between all the sections in the song um and they also managed to deliver the 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 message i was trying to deliver because you know with the lyrics you're talk, you, you're talking about um frustration and strain and hard times basically and i think that what going through hard time a hard time does to you is is this basically you know so you have your there's moments when you're down there's moments when you're uh, a bit up higher you're you're cheering up and then you're down once again and and the song is just trying to do that so in in the verse it's like you're you, you don't know what to do you're just stuck in there and you're just trying to find your way out of the situation and then in the chorus you're just like okay i'm done with this i'm tired and then you're screaming out all your frustration and strain and and everything so uh, we decided that we really wanted to give the lyrics uh, um I, I don't know the the proper space so it I put the lyrics on top of the song as usual. We already we had written it, written it already, but this time we we really took a step further and decided to to use the music to tell the story behind it, even more so than before, and that's why the the bouncy the bouncy thing between all sections. <laughs> And oddly enough, it was a perfect time to release it during a global pandemic where it just kind of it's, everyone's going through hard times yeah. right now. So it yeah. ended up being the perfect time to release it. And I'm looking at more of my notes right now. And there was something that I really want to talk about in this song that wasn't mm-hmm. that was also, you know, kind of goes along with the the waviness of it. But it was going to be more with your vocals specifically, because um, especially with you being from Italy, I assume that Italian is your native language, correct? Yeah. Okay, because just you've got to bear with me. I'm definitely going somewhere on this one because I I could definitely hear just within the vocals. You were speaking English, but it just it wasn't something where I, it was something I could tell where English wasn't your native language. However, just because it was just all the way some words are pronounced and how certain things are drawn out. But in the end, especially on a song like this, that gave you an advantage overall when it comes to this song being as as impactful as I think it easily can be, especially when you guys go back to playing live shows. And the reason behind is because when it comes to pop music for me, especially listening to it, a lot of artists really get lost in the shuffle because every time I listen to it, it's always like kind of like the same thing. It's like the, there's something that it's like, especially even with the vocals as well. It's like, okay, all these, a lot of these vocalists have great styles, but I can easily find like five or six more that it like, you know, looking them up, just like, okay, where the sounds are going to be almost identical just in terms of vocals, but just because, I mean, they're, they're good. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. However, I'm like the vocal difference, especially on this one where it's just the pronunciation is a little bit different and just the way it sounds, it just stood out so well where all of a sudden it got me more drawn into the song than Mm -hmm. just the way it was written. Because then again, like I I've said, the only reason I keep saying just to kind of keep giving context, everybody, you guys don't like the harder style of stuff, but when it came out to this one, it was just like the vocals were so standoutish because it had more of that pop rock, alt rock kind of feel, but the vocals were something I hadn't really heard of just because it just, the just being a native Italian speaker, just kind of the kind of a little bit of more of the, the dialect behind it and how words are formed, how words are pronounced, trying to kind of pronounce words in English. It just changed up a little bit, but it worked so well. Oh, oh, that's, that's nice. I'm, I'm always afraid of, of coming across as a bit too much of an Italian girl, you know? So I, I'm always trying to get my accent right, to, to get my pronunciation right, to get all the sentences right. But, you know, I'm not going to notice everything, but if, if, so I must assume, just correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying that perceiving a foreign accent is what gives this song a, a bit of an extra thumbs up. I, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of another good way to describe it, but it's just the way that it's just using the fact that you are not, you know, don't, don't have uh, English as your native language. Just the way that certain Italian words might be pronounced, trying to translate uh, or trying to pronounce English words, but using like maybe 
pronunciations that would be more common in Italian words, uh-huh. kind of putting them on top of that just because there's certain words like I can tell maybe they're not pronounced just like perfectly okay. as, as like, you know, as someone normally would. It speaks English uh, as their native language. But it just the sound of them just mixed so well with the way the song was sounding. Oh. It stood out so well. I, I, I mean, it's kind of it's it's still kind of hard to describe the way, but it's something where just listening to listen, normally hearing those words and hearing how you sang them. It was just there was a slight. Di- it wasn't a massive difference. It wasn't it wasn't huge. It was small, but it was for me, it was noticeable enough to really just kind of s- stand out in my mind and then listen to it again a couple more times. It was a thing that stood out, but it was something that was standing out in such a positive light because it was different, but it also added to the power of your vocals as well when you did that. Oh, well, that, that's a nice analysis. I've, uh, I've never had any one time with this, really. But were there any specific words? I, I can't even remember the specific words off the top of my head. Now I'm curious. I could, I'd have to listen to it a couple more times to just really write down some of the words. But okay. or even if they weren't just like specific words, it was maybe just like the, the way it flowed overall. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's something that I could tell. But it was also something where it's like I could... I could tell, but it ended up, it was something that was a much more helpful to the song because it stood out okay. so much better. And it kind of also added with like that cinematic feel as well to it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just don't know exactly how to describe it, but it was just so stand out ish that when I, I can easily see that, you know, once the whole entire pandemic is over, you guys are able to get back out, play live shows, that this song, especially with more of that alternative and pop rock crowd, this song is going to be a massive hit with them. I really hope so, and I really hope we can manage to play live soon because I, I, I want to know what it feels like to play that song live. It's not going to be easy because it's not an easy song to sing at all. But I'm really, really curious. I, I really look forward to it. It's uh, it's frustrating not to be able to play, but I mean, every band in the world is is in the same situation as we are, so I can't complain that much. It would, it's- it would be unfair. Yeah, it's something where it's, I mean, we're all, no one's happy that musicians yeah. can't play live. From from your perspective, you want to go out, you want to play live, you want to be able to play the song, you want to be able to connect with the fans that way. Mm-hmm. Someone like me, just as a fan, it's like, I want to get out there because when I go and see concerts and I go see live shows, especially for bands that, you know, like I'm super into and want to see and just, you know, it was just rocking out, just kind of just h- hanging out with people or, you know, jumping a mosh pit, going crazy. It's like for that time during when I'm at that, or that time during the show, Anything that's going on in life, anything else that's going on, it just completely goes away. Yeah. Any any bad thoughts, any bad things just go away. And all I'm focused on is kind of how the music is making me feel and how much fun I'm having. That's all the focus is. Yeah, I, I miss concerts as a fan as well. I really, I'm, I'm a big concert goer. So I, it, it, that really took me off guard. It, I've never went this many this many months without without attending any concerts. And it's really, really tiring i don't like it i know there's bigger issues in the world i'm not saying that going to concert is the main issue at the moment of course but from my own perspective that's really hard <laughs> i'm i would say same here same here maybe because of this pandemic i miss spirit box and i'm really really mad at it <laughs> i i won't forget this pandemic ever because of this Oh, same here. It's just, and that's, that's one thing, especially like during this pandemic, I've been trying to talk with more artists as well, just because as I miss concerts, I'm, I miss, I miss connecting with musicians in that way. And when I do these podcasts, it's, it's a comparable feeling where all of a sudden I'm talking to artists, we're talking about all these different songs the music they've made. And it just makes me forget about anything else going on in the world. Even if we end up talking about the pandemic, I just forget about anything else that's going on. Yeah. And it's just, it's something where it's like, I'm, I just get so focused in on it. Like, this is, this is what I like to do. I get that same feeling and it's great. I can't help it. It's just awesome. Yes. You get the thrill. It's like, yeah, your mind goes blank in a positive way. It's just, it's just incredible. But I, I don't know when we're going to be able to play again. So. I mean, I hope again, hopefully soon, but again, who, who knows at any given moment, just because anything yeah. can change, who knows what's going to happen all of a sudden in a couple of days, all of a sudden they can say, Oh, you know, this, we've like this vaccine passed and like our second trial or something. Now what's going on the third trial after that, boom, then we're going to be ready to go with it. That could happen. Or you never know how long it's going to be. It's just, n- no one knows exactly how, however, yeah. what's going to end up happening. And then all of a sudden, you know, once concerts are able to start coming back, 
How are they going to look? What's it going to be like? Is it going to be like it was back before this all happened? Or are people going to have to be more spaced out for the time being? You just never know. It's, yeah, it kind of stinks. I don't know if uh, they've already decided something in the U.S., but for example, in Italy, they they said, I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to be approved or anything, but um, every venue... In every venue, there's going to be like two meters between each each person. Obviously, uh, everyone wearing masks. Uh, uh, you need to, you need to get social distancing between members of the band as well. So you need bigger stages. You need fewer people on the stage. And you know we're four, and that's okay. But what happens if a band has six, seven, eight members? What can Slipknot do in this situation? Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Well, like, what can Slipknot <laughs> so, do in a situation like yeah. this? You know, social distancing at a live show. I don't know if I could, if I can deal with it. I don't know if I can, if I want to get to go to a show like that. So probably it's best to keep everything stopped for a while because I, I want to get in the crowd. I don't want to stand mm-hmm. with two people distancing with two meters between me and the next person. It's it's really sad, and I think it's it will be extremely sad for people on stage as well. Yes, you and I are in the exact same kind of mindset when it comes to that as well, because especially the shows I like to go to, I mean, crowds are always packed, mosh pits are always going, crowd surfing is one of the most normal things ever. And that's the best part of concerts, I mean. Oh, God, yeah, it's just because that's where all the raw energy comes through, because I've been been to shows where all of a sudden it's like, I'm trying to think, so earlier this year before the whole pandemic thing started, I went to go see Alter Bridge play live. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to go see Alter Bridge play live, and they played, they played great, but I had to remember that I'm like, no one's going to be going crazy during this show. Yeah. So one thing I had to do is I had to focus on other things in order to really kind of like, it's kind of like, kind of like a drug way. It's like, I just got to get my feel. Like, how am I going to be able to like, you know, get that feeling of like, you know, every kind of letting everything go. And when it came to watching a hard rock show with Alter Bridge, I'm like, okay, let's watch, let's see what I can find. And the thing I focused on was specifically with Mark Tremonti and his guitar playing. Cause yeah. I'm like, I can't do that. Like, there's, I can't even comprehend that. But then there's that, that some guitarists can't even comprehend what this guy is doing. I'm just like, huh? And that's where I really got lost into it. And then b- about a week after that show, it was the last big show I got to see because I was, saw the word alive escape the fate and falling in reverse. Mm-hmm. And that show was packed. Mosh Pit was going great. And I'm just like, okay, this is kind of like, this is def. It was for me, it was easier to get into. But now I'm thinking about it, it's, you know, we're going to go back to live shows at some point. And then what's it going to be like? And for me, especially wanting to go to these hard rock metal shows, metalcore shows, punk rock shows where all this is going to be prevalent. And they're going to try and make us stand six feet apart from each other. How is that going to oh, work? Especially yeah, because oh. there's going to be a bunch of punk rockers or metal heads. They're just going to want to say, screw this. And they're just going to end up starting something. Exactly. Exactly. My The last big show I attended was... Was it? It was Pick Friend Autopsy, The Artist Murder, and Carnifex. Like, I think it was the okay. lineup. And I loved it because they're just great. But if I look back, I just think if they organize that same live show now, would people stand a couple of, a couple of meters away from each other? No, they wouldn't. And, and I would understand it. So the best thing to do is just to leave it. Just leave it until it's all over. Because I. I I, I don't know. It would be, I think that even such big artists would be, would be just losing money. Then those shows were just half people can, can come in, you know, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. And I know I, I, I got, I'm trying to find uh, who it was, but uh, someone created this whole entire, uh, like it was like a three tweet thread. And I think I might have it on my phone. I'm not sure. It was someone from Attila, but I forgot where my phone went because it dropped somewhere. Oh, there it is. Eh. Got my appendix scars are still trying to heal, so trying to bend down is like a little, uh, a little careful, bit. Please. And they, they were worse yesterday, so don't worry. But yeah, I got to find it because I have it here. It was um, so was, I forgot who it was from Attila, but this is what he, this is what he said. I've had a lot of talk with the higher ups within the music industry things are going to be very different for the future of live music a lot more different than any of you could imagine also it's very unlikely that any concerts will happen until 2021 or later yeah goes on to say because of the strict limits that will be imposed on or uh or no i'm sorry Uh, i spoke too early when concerts do come back, let's say 2021, there will be strict rules about distancing the amount of people allowed in the venue. No moshing, no crowd surfing, no stage diving. Everyone will essentially be standing isolated, just listening to music and nothing more. 
because of the strict limits that will be imposed on the venue capacity, tours won't be financially viable for any bands unless ticket prices are raised a lot higher. This sucks, but I have a few ideas about how we as bands can make this higher ticket price worth it for the fans. I'm not saying this to be pessimistic in any way. I'm always extremely optimistic. I just know a lot of insider info pertaining to the music industry and things that are way different than any of you could imagine. Will it ever go back to normal? Sure, but not soon. Which okay. I gotta say sucks. I mean, I'm I'm hoping. I'm always hoping. Like you know, I just want to get back to it because again, like we were talking earlier, we love when going to live shows. We love experiencing that, yeah. and it's just the energy is not going to be the same if all of a sudden we have to stand <laughs> six feet apart from each other. Yeah, even if you don't mosh, because I don't mosh uh, very much because I'm like. I don't know how you translate meters in feet. I'm sorry. I think I'm like five feet tall. Okay. Uh, well, if you, how many me, how, like, well, how tall are you when it comes to meters? We'll put it that way. And I can think if I can, if I can do the calculation in my head, I'm I can. I'm like 153 centimeters. Okay. So like five feet, five feet one. Yeah. But five, one, five foot one, five foot two for okay. all the, for, for all of us in America here who aren't okay, on the metric system. Is, your metric system confuses our, me a lot. Oh, our system confuses us as well. <laughs> Great. So, you know, I'm just like this. I just can get into the crowd because I, I'm just going to get smashed by all, all, all these <laughs> huge guys swirling around. But it's part of the energy as well. Even if I stay on the side of the venue, you know, you, you just can't feel it going on. Mm-hmm. So even if even if you can take active part in it because you're just going to get killed at some point, <laughs> just witnessing it with the music going on, it's just it's just such a unique feeling. Just the only I think only metal concerts can give this to you. Oh, that, easily. The like solidarity thing, you know, and <laughs> being apart from each from everyone is just not going to work. So I hope, uh, who was it in Attila you were reading? Uh, shoot, let me, let me, I gotta see if I can just pull up his, uh, his Twitter real quick. This is, yeah, this is the one good thing I have about being on my computer for this. So, woohoo. <laughs> Cause you, I'm assuming that, uh, yeah. bigger bands who are more involved with the music industry are <laughs> surely more informed than we are. Yeah. And if they're saying that it's going to be even harder than we anticipated, yeah, it's going to suck really hard. Yeah, give me one sec. I'm trying to get his. Yeah. I'm trying to get his. I'm trying to get his name because on Twitter he doesn't have his name. But I'm just trying to find who it is. It is uh It's the lead singer Chris Franzak. Oh, okay. So I just want to make sure I got his name right because I was not they want to mess that okay. up. But just looking at that, it's just kind of like, especially for me, I'm just like, oh no, just because I, I I get where he's coming from, and it's I mean, like the, over the past week, I had two shows get canceled that I was supposed to go to, and then one get postponed without a date in sight. And I'm just like, oh man, just because it just every time it happens, I just like I just get a little bit more downtrodden. I would say yeah. because I. I don't want to see these concerts. I, I want like, it just kind of just like takes down some of the hope a little bit that all of a sudden yeah. I'm going to get back and be able to, you know, see a live show and go crazy once again. It, yeah. it, it, it sucks. It's It just sucks. It really does suck. I, I remember when it first started, uh, I was supposed to go see, it was like spirit box after the burial, the whole lineup. And it was oh like, Oh my on God. March 8th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was like March 8th and I remember thinking oh maybe this whole thing will be over by March 8th poor innocent me yeah I I mean we still suck I, I really underestimated the how hard this thing would hit all of us so when did the lockdown start in the US Um. so everything basically started getting shut down I believe it was on I'm trying to think because it was it was the it was like everything started getting shut down. Everyone was kind of freaking out. And then the next, like, I went to bed that night and I woke up early in the morning because I had food poisoning, which is just kind of weird because all of a sudden everyone's freaking out the virus. I'm like, do I have it? I was like, wait, that's a respiratory thing. And I've got a stomach issue. Yeah, that's this ain't it. <laughs> but it all ha- started happening on March 11th. And the biggest thing was because at the NBA, the National Basketball Association, they suspended their season that day. Mm-hmm. And then there was travel restrictions put in place like about a half hour after that happened. 
for international travel because it's like yeah you have two days to get home kind of thing and everyone's freaking out and all like and i was all the musicians i was following that were overseas at that point they're like okay we're struggling to just get home and just like oh this is going to be interesting to see how this all plays out and then everything started getting shut down more and more um as of i think the official for where i live in the state that i live in the official like shutdown order came like march 22nd or something okay but then, but like beforehand, everything was starting to get shut down more and more. Where all of a sudden it was the bars and restaurants had to close. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, end of day, March seventeenth, and then it was two months before anything was happening because every because here in the here in the United States, it was the federal government never put like a whole entire like stay at home order as like a shelter in place order in, but it was up to the individual states to do it. Okay, and a lot of them did, but a few of them didn't. So everyone, so there was always a lot of animosity going between a bunch of different mm-hmm. people because it's like, oh, well, you can do this, but we can't do this. Why is that the case? Well, yeah. in some states, you know, like New York, it, I took, I recently took a look. It's like if you just kept New York as itself, it was like the fifth, like if New York was its own country, it'd have the fifth highest amount of cases in the world oh. for us. Oh, my God. For but then you, me. yeah, but then you look at a state further out west that's kind of it's it's a it's a bigger state but it's got a lot less people in it called i think uh, i think it was montana Uh i mean they had under a thousand cases reported so they never shut down anything because everyone's so much spread out already that's just the way that's just the way it is so it's like there's a lot of anim and then there's some bigger states that didn't shut down there's a lot of animosity going forward where i live all of a sudden it was uh like the local like the state government put in something in the state supreme court which is like the high court like yeah you know uh you didn't follow the rules on this one. So they just kind of stopped it and everything kind of started opening back up again. It's just, it's, it's nothing's nothing. No one knows exactly what's going on. We'll put it that it's way. Confusing. It's always confusing. Cause where I live, it's the city that I, the city that I live in, everything is still shut down, but the, but the neighboring communities that aren't under that city specifically stuff can open up. Oh, so it's, it's like nothing is making sense at all. That's the best way to describe it. I think it's understandable because we don't have that much data. We don't have that much information. So at the end of the day, it's just common sense and following your your local rules. No, Nobody was prepared to face this. So oh, no. Every government is trying to do their best, I think. Yeah, and it's just trying to make sure everyone stays safe. And now with yeah. things opening up, it's one thing that I've seen is um because last week because uh basically the whole entire order for our my state specifically got it was like yeah you know you guys can start going up and opening up stuff this happened last week i think it was last week thursday i think may 14th it happened and then uh over the weekend one of my friends wanted to go for a bike ride so him and i were just biking around just seeing what was going on and there were a good amount of places like uh like different parks that were just packed with people but everyone was still kind of spread out so it's it was somewhere people are still going to be going out and doing more things but the pe- but there are people that are going to end up being more separated. There's still going to be a very small few where all of a sudden, you know, there's there's a couple of bars by where I live. And yesterday I was outside walking around just to try and, you know, stretch out, especially after having surgery that early that mm-hmm. morning, just to kind of, oh, just kind of get the blood flowing. And there was a bar that was just absolutely packed. I'm just like, well, I'm not going in there today. But yeah. then again, I'm not going in there anyway. So, eh. yeah, it's just uh I hope that I hope people follow common sense. I really do, but I'm I, I'm not very. I don't have that much faith in people at the moment. You I don't know, think a we'll lot see. of people do. Yeah, we'll see what happens. It's just I, I think that may, many people are very self aware. So even if we go out. We're super spread. We're always making we're always making sure we have our masks on. We don't get too close. We don't we, we try not touch each other. So you know, let's hope everybody can do that. That's the hope. But then again, there's going to be people that aren't going to follow that. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the end, what what I end up hoping for is just is is this that we end up beating this virus, and then, of course, things are going to slowly get back to you know what we're able to do. And yeah. it's like I keep seeing the last thing is going to be, you know, live music, which is like, you got to be kidding me, because that's the one thing that I love to do. Everyone that I talk to, that's the thing that they love to do. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. It's the last thing they're saying. Oh, dear God. But then again, it's going to be interesting because kind of being more on the optimistic standpoint, 
what happens when all of a sudden, okay, now everyone's able to, like, concerts are back to normal. People are able to start, you know, going crazy again. Mosh pits, you know, there's no problems with that, no problems with crowd surfing, no problems with people being packed tightly into a, uh, a music venue. Band goes on stage and everyone's going crazy. Because what I'm always interested to see at that time is, what are these bands going to do? Like, they've been, they haven't been able to do these shows in a long time. What's the kind of energy they're going to bring? Yeah. Well, how much touring are they going to do? How much new music is going to be released? How much of this stuff is going to happen all at once? Yeah, it's uh, j- just just imagine those bands playing a show before people who cannot crowd serve or march or anything. You have to find another way to entertain your crowd. And it's not easy. Uh, it's really not easy. I, I'm curious to know what they're going to come up with. It's It's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be something that's going to be very fluid in a way where it's just it's always going to be changing no yeah. one's going to really because no one knows what to do yeah i mean i mean when it come when it finally comes back to the time where you can play live shows do you have an idea of what you could potentially do for a show like that to kind of you know be able to recreate the energy and the passion that the fans would have during that show just because or just given the limitations of people being further apart from each other <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> That's really hard. I, I must admit it that I didn't think of this. But, you know, those people are in the venue for you. So I think that's enough. That's enough to play, to just to do everything you can to, make, to, to give them a good time. Because they're in the venue, they're two meters apart, each of you. From one another, they're wearing masks. It's probably going to be hot. They're going to be sweating under their masks, but they're here for you anyway. So uh, I think that's enough for you to understand how much they care and how much they believe in you and in your band because they're there suffering (laughs) for you. So we're going to try, we're going to try our best. I mean, as long as you try your best, that's pretty much what you're going to have to do at that point. Yeah. And then, yeah. not only that, but you keep trying your best. Ever the people that are going to be for that show are going to they're going to be there for you specifically. That's I like what you said about that because for someone like me, it's like I go to I go to a lot of shows, but then again, are some of these shows am I going to end up if I have to stay six feet apart from each other? Am I going to end up passing on? Probably just because well, like the, the the like one of the biggest reasons why I go there is to kind of be have that whole entire real concert experience and get lost in the music. If I'm not able to get lost in the music the way that that happens, why am I like it's it's somewhere it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna go for that specific band. But if it, what if it's a band where it's like I like their sound, I like their music, but when it comes down to specific songs, like do I really know a lot of their songs that well? I might not. And it's just kind of, it's going to be tough for me to get into, but then all of a sudden, you know, the bands that I absolutely love that I know, I'm like, you know, I'm like, I love every single, almost every single song. I know almost every single song. Would I go and see them just to see them? Yeah, probably. Yes. But, it, but it's something where as a live performer, when I am just kind of thinking about it, cause I know you said like, that's a real good question you really think about, but already the self-awareness that you have on that one, where they're going to be there for you and know that they're going to be there because they want to see you perform that's a head start above so many other artists and bands going forward because you already have an idea of how much the people there are going to mean to you and how much you mean to them. So then you can already start figuring out when you're doing these live shows, how to make it so that the people that are there specifically for you that really want to see you get that or feel that you really want to like, you want to be there and you're so happy that they're there that you're going to try and give them the best show possible. We're, that's hard. That's just hard. We always try to do our best because whenever we play, it's, playing is just our favorite thing. You know, creating music, record, music recording, everything is nice, but playing is just the best thing. So if, if before this, we just loved playing shows, now we are going to be, we're just going to be extremely stoked. I, 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 whenever the first time we can play, I just want people under the stage to feel how much we're happy and how much we're grateful that they're there. Because I want to realize that we're not taking for granted that they're that they're here for us. Um, 
I just want to them to feel all the energy and the happiness and the um, and the relief because playing live is going to be a relief for us and for fans because they're looking they're looking forward to concerts as much as we are so I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be sort of an intertwining thing because there's going to be fans looking forward to live shows there's going to be artists looking forward to live shows and so this energy is going to create something beautiful even if people can't move I think everyone is going to to feel that and so I don't I don't think we I don't think bands are going to are going to have to find new way to entertain as much as uh, they're going to find a way to make people realize to make people feel how much they're how how grateful they are to be on stage for them and so rather than for them with them finally being able to be in a venue with with people with fans with someone to connect with so that's what we as bands are going to be are going to have to be focusing on i think i say i never even brought up that question before ever where it came kind of the like what are you planning on doing like once casual will go back and kind of really go ahead of it and what's it going to be like but my God, that was, I, I think that might've been the perfect answer for that because it's going to be something, it, it, correct, it's going to be something completely different where like a lot of the bands, especially like a lot of the hard, more like the more metal, hardcore bands that we end up seeing, it's, their shows are always, all, you know, all about uh, go, have people going as crazy as possible and just the energy being traded off between the artists on stage and the fans in the crowd, where all of a sudden the artists on stage is going to be going crazy, the fans in the crowd are going to be going even crazier, and it's just going to yeah. keep trading off to try and top each other. Because I was at a show like that in October where uh, after the burial went on, and they were going nuts, so all of a sudden the mosh pit's going absolutely insane. I was in there, got knocked down during the last song, got a huge cut above my eye, wasn't too happy about it, but whatever, it happens. It happens, yeah. Should have gotten stitches for it, but I didn't because uh, the headliner was motionless and white, and I really wanted to see <laughs> them again. So I didn't jump back in the pit, but I was on the edge of it because like, I just didn't want to have the cut open up again, bleed over everybody. That's just not a good time. <laughs> but just all of a sudden, motionless and white comes out, and the crowd was just still so amped up that all of a sudden it was the crowd was going nuts the mosh pit was even crazier then all of a sudden motionless and white started feeding off that energy and they started just going even crazier building it up then the crowd just built it back up they, that was everyone was trying to top each other one after another yeah, they, they lost it <laughs> yeah it was something where it was like okay now they're going to go do something even crazier all right as a crowd what are we going to do it was kind of like a it was kind of like a battle between the two of us but it was just everything was just kind of amping up every step yeah. of the way by the time the show ended it was just like a hot, i don't even know how you top this it was insane but again now it's like it's gonna be completely different but i love how you've talked about making sure that the fans know how appreciative you are and really because it's going to be a smaller crowd but you're gonna be able to connect with more fans on a personal basis because yeah. there are less people. Yeah. So being able to focus a little bit more on that could be incredibly helpful when it comes back to going back to live shows and remembering that because no one knows what it's gonna be like exactly yeah. because we're still we still can't go back to going to live shows or you guys playing live shows. Yeah, we're sitting we're sitting in the middle of the whole thing. So who knows? At this point, who knows? Who knows? But again, the fact that you're already thinking about this stuff, you're it's so much further ahead or planning ahead so that when the time comes, you have an idea, you're ready to go. Because, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much going on right now where there are people or different artists out there that are trying different things just to make sure that during this time when you can't play live shows, you can't go on tour, that basically their band doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, exactly. That's the hardest thing. I mean, for smaller bands... Uh, Live shows are important, but I think that social media presence is just as important because if you want to get to people in the U.S., of course, playing live shows is not going to help you. Yeah, but play, playing live shows in Europe isn't going to help you become uh, super Europe, popular in the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> playing live shows in, in, your, in, your, in your area is... I, I, I wasn't saying that playing live shows isn't useful. Um, no, no I, I, can, I'm, yeah. I, I can easily understand what you're saying. We're playing live shows. You're not saying playing live shows isn't useful. It's just... Playing exclusively playing live shows is useful, but it only has a limited reach. To a certain extent, yeah. yeah. Where it's yeah. like if you're playing live shows all the way over, like you're constantly playing live shows over in like Italy, Austria, Slovakia, Germany, all around that area. A lot of over here in the U.S. where I am, 
I mean, we're not going to really know about it just because exactly. live shows, it's just going to be so much more localized and centralized in that one area. But now, I mean, just the way the, the way the world is, especially during this pandemic where everyone is online all the time, everyone's on social media, everyone's listening to music just because they're trying to find something new. But because everyone's looking on their computer screens, everyone's looking on their phones or on their TVs for something, it's, yeah. there's, an oppor- it's, there's an opportunity there to kind of get your music exactly. more out there. So um, we're fortunate enough to have the internet. So if this pandemic happened in the, I don't know, in the 70s, would, is, would ACDC have become this famous? Who knows? I'm going to say, heck, you can have become this famous? Who knows? You can go back 20 years. Would anyone, would, if this happened in the year 2000, would some of these bands that, you know, were getting big in the beginning of that, uh, like the new millennium, would they have gotten big? Probably not. And because, yeah. okay. I mean, what, exactly. social media in the year 2000, there was nothing, there was nothing of it. There, it was non-existent. Yeah. The internet was around, but there was no connection like there is there's, yeah. like today. Right now we're lucky enough to have plenty of instruments to get up to the other side of the world without moving. So for bands, uh, this pandemic is, I think, obviously, this pandemic is going to hit all bands because you can play live shows. They're, it's obviously going to hit harder on bigger bands because they make profit mm-hmm. of live shows and merch. It's their job. So for smaller bands like us, it's obviously going to cause uh, many missed opportunities. But if, if you have a band, you have to focus on something else. You just can't let it go. You, you have to you have to find another way to create good content, upload good content, f- find a way to to make people remember you, so that when it all goes back to normal, there's someone coming to your shows. Because you, a small a small band can can just hope that live shows are going to to help it grow. They are obviously going to, but not, they're not the only thing. Exactly. I think exactly. Can help a band. Luckily, we have many, many other ways at the moment. So, and one thing I've been noticing too is, is some of these like the biggest bands. I'm talking about the really, really big ones. During this whole pandemic, it's kind of like they have it. Like, just I pay attention on social media a lot, just because with all of this stuff, that's where I have to be. I have to be paying attention yeah. to this stuff. And a lot of like the real big bands. I'm talking like you know like like your Metallica's, your your Slipknot's, yeah. like the big guys. It seems like they're not doing nearly as much as some of like the medium-sized bands or the real small bands are doing. And yeah, because they don't have to. <laughs> yeah, but the, but the one thing that always is making me think about this too is sure they don't have to do they don't have to do some of this stuff, but what's it going to be like all of a sudden once this ends? Because there are bands like and there's two that are just sticking out in my head right now that are kind of more that small medium, like more one's like smallish medium. And one is more that medium sized band where someone's doing something that mm-hmm. is just really kind of trying to hit a new audience. One of those bands is from ashes to new. Cause they're always doing different covers of songs, mm-hmm. but they're putting, but the, and like, they'll bring in like guest vocalists. Like I know they did one with, for uh, they basically covered uh, Papa Roach's gravity. But okay. then instead of having Mar- for Maria Brink's vocal part, they brought in Jen Ledger from Skillet to do it. Oh, so it's like it's like they're mixing all this stuff up and they're putting out a line. They're putting funny stuff up. They did a whole entire uh, parody of Wake Me Up When September Ends by Green Day with Wake Me Up When 2020 Ends. And it was just them just hanging out like literally by themselves doing nothing. And then they it's like, oh, 2020 is over. They go outside and one guy gets killed because it's like up oh, 2020, 2021, the year of the purge. So all of a sudden everyone goes back inside like, OK, try and stay safe. So it's it's funny with what they do. And then it's just kind of putting stuff out like that, just doing something completely different, a little bit wacky, a little bit funnier. Their band has been growing significantly during this time. Another band that has been on my radar for this has been Falling in Reverse, specifically with Ronnie Radke, because yeah. he's been streaming on Twitch and he's like the number six streamer on Twitch right now. Oh. And it, and you start and he's, the dude started like a couple months ago, and it's just that's it, it's it's working because you're getting so you're you're gaining a much more you're getting much more exposure and you're getting a larger audience just by doing yeah. different things and trying yeah. to do different things and trying to grow your band. So when it comes to the, like, but then again, they already kind of had a fan base to begin with that they built up because they've been around for, for years. So all of a sudden it's like, it's just building more and more, but they're able to start out with a quite a nice base because they built it. They earned it. That's the key is they built it and they already earned it. Now they're just gaining more on it. 
But yeah. with bands that are not nearly as big at that point as they are, I'm always interested to hear what those bands are doing and kind of take a look and see what those bands are doing. And a lot of the bands I interview on this podcast, I think I've asked every single one of this. And I'm going to throw this at you as well. During this time, what are you guys doing to grow the band and make sure that you continually are having more people listen to your music and more people follow your stuff online? Well, we've been uploading some videos of, for example, me singing one of our songs and Daniela playing one of our songs. And then we've reached out to a few magazines to, to get interviews. And of course, we, we released Ghost. We, we didn't mean to release in the middle of a, of a pandemic, of course, but it happened. So we just rolled with it. We we had a bit of, a bit of we had some magazines uh, release some interviews, some news, some uh we try to get some someone to talk about us so because it gets i think it gets the audience a bit more curious because if if you see someone talking about something you think oh why are they talking about that specific thing i want to know so you get curious and you go check it out and that doesn't work always of course but that's the main strategy we, we use, but because we had we had just released a new song, and so that was the, the most logical thing to do at the moment. Oh, and it makes a lot of sense as well. And like we talked about earlier, when you're talking about the meaning of the song behind uh, Ghosts as well, it just actually worked out in your favor, just given the meaning as well. Yeah. Because, hey, everyone's going through the hard time right now. So exactly. Kind of worked out all right, yeah. <laughs> and and that's what that's what I like about it. it's like you know you're just kind of going with the flow as well. It's like if something happens where all of a sudden you know this pandemic happens, you didn't mean to release a song during a pandemic, but it happened anyway. It's instead of being you know oh we, oh this happened this sucks oh what why did this happen instead of thinking about that you thought okay this happened now what do we do to like how do we like how do we use the given circumstance to do the best that we can. Exactly. Exactly. We had to find a way, and we just used the the time we had to produce new music, new stuff, and to think of the future because we had to understand how to arrange everything in order to have it work it out. In order to work it out, because it was, we realized we couldn't meet for like two, three months. So I I had to buy um, some cables. I had to buy a few things in order to record from to record from home because I didn't have anything. So. Thank you, Amazon, for working <laughs> because it was able to. We were able to exchange ideas and files and stuff, and that helped. Of course, we we managed we managed we managed not to get stuck. That's and that's the key. That, that's, that's the key. Matters. Is is you didn't get stuck and you just kept you kept building still. Yeah. It's you you kept working on building your audience. You kept working on new music. You kept working on trying to make sure that more people would listen. As time went on, you didn't just say, okay, this pandemic kept, we can't play live shows. So our whole entire, you know, what we were doing with music, it kind of got put on hold. No, you're like, okay, this happened. These are, the, this is kind of the parameters right now. These are the, what's happening right now. This is what we can do. So we can't do. So with what we can do, how can we make that work in our favor? How can we make that work to our advantage to continue to grow the band, to continue to grow yeah. our sound yeah. and to continue to get people to listen to our music? Yeah. That's the only, I think the bands couldn't do anything else. Right now, it's the only thing they, that any band could do in order to to, to be able to grow. I, I don't know if we managed to grow a lot, but at least we managed to not to lose anything. We managed to keep the situation as it was. We managed to get everything under control. So, yeah, that's that's a success for us. I mean, think in that sense, it's basically kind of you manage not to get lost in the in the shuffle of everything. Yeah. You manage yeah. to maintain you, where you manage to maintain the size of the audience that you were working yeah, with exactly. and even potentially grow it a little bit. Because, I mean, still 15,500 Spotify listeners per month. I mean, come on, that says something. Yeah, we work hard on that as well. We we, we never let go, really. We work hard every single day. So and it shows I, I'm not bragging. But I'm simply saying I'm happy that our our hard work shows and pays off because otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. And it's I mean, it's like 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 I'm saying, it's clearly shown because even when all of a sudden you reach out to me, it's like, hey, can you take a listen to Ghost and see what you think about it? 
Yeah, sure. Why not? You know, I, I love it when that stuff happens. And all of a sudden someone reached out to me, asked me to listen to their music. I'm like, oh, my God, someone values my opinion. This is great. <laughs> And then listen to them like, okay, let's listen to some more. Let's listen to some more. Let's listen to some more of their other stuff. Okay. I, I'm intrigued. I'm interested. Let's go do this. And I'll say like, yeah, okay, I'm let's see. I'm very happy with for your, for your opinion because the review you gave me of Ghost was very thorough and I really, really liked it. I, yeah, I don't think we've ever got such a deep review of that, of that specific song. And ooh. yeah, it was, <laughs> there was, there were many, many things uh, that, I reflected upon it was pretty nice i really really did appreciate it oh well, thank you because again one thing i wanted to do for that one was when you sent me was i never want to I, I never want to just be like oh you know just put out oh it's good oh it's bad kind of i never just want to just leave it at that because all of a sudden it's like if i just say it's good you're like it might be like i get a thank you out of it but then it's just okay then what did you really mean by it yeah and when i listened to it it was it was something where at first when i first listened to it i wasn't sure i felt about it because it it wasn't what I was expecting because at times when I get music like that, I'm always getting stuff that's more metal, more pop punk because mm-hmm. there was a band I interviewed. I think it was a little bit uh, about a month and a half ago from Brazil because they mm-hmm. asked me to listen to their uh, cause they're a thrash metal band. They asked me to listen to their album. So, I mean, that's kind of the stuff that I expect more. But yeah. all of a sudden then I heard Ghost. I'm like, I had to listen to it again just because I was thrown off by it at first. <laughs> Because again, it just wasn't was what wasn't what I was expecting. Yeah. But I listened to it, and it's something where it was again. Is it a style for me that I'm gonna particularly like? And I, I had to be honest, and it was something that for my style of music that I like, it wasn't something I would listen to over and over mm-hmm. again. However, that's not gonna stop me from going through it, giving my thoughts on the music, and just really trying to come up with something thorough as to now was there a spot that I saw something that I liked? Absolutely. I, if I'm if there's a spot I like something, am I gonna say it? Of course, I'm going to say it because that's that's just the honest to God's truth. And then mm-hmm. afterwards, I'm afterwards after listening to it, the one thing I wanted to do after was I wanted to go into some more of your music just to see if it was like what your music sounded like, because I'm not going to get your sound based off of one song. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. going to get anyone's sound based off of one song. So that's when I went and I jumped to waves. And I just thought, oh, this is something different from what I listened to with Ghost. OK. Just hearing that, that that drumming, I'm just like, okay, this is something way different. Okay, let's keep listening. Let's keep listening. And then that's where I kind of – and then that's why I really wanted to talk to you on the podcast today just because after listening to Ghost, after listening to Waves, after listening to Dance in the Sun, it was just something where it's – I can t- I can definitely tell your sound's more based on more of that alternative style. Yeah. However, there's so much more going on there than you would just – you can't just say alternative like and that's the way they are that's the way that yeah, that I always is. have a hard time defining our genre whenever someone's asking I'm like mm, I don't know alternative <laughs> rock with electronic elements you tell me <laughs> I, I mean if it's kind of like if someone's going to ask you like okay what's your style of music all you're going to have to say at some point is just yes <laughs> just just straight up yes just because there's so much more going yeah. on there than yeah. w- than what else is going on there because you can't you can't it's what people want to do a lot of people want to do is they want to put bands in a certain genre in a certain box it's like okay this is their sound this is their style and that's that but there's so much more going on where there are some bands are they going to want to stick with that style absolutely they're going to want to some bands even create their own style off of it and it works but if it's like oh you know they're just a post-hardcore band no that's not the case there's so much more going on there oh they're just an alternative rock band no oh there's just like synth rock no there's so much more going on there there's so much more and all of a sudden it's it's w- one thing i always thought about was one thing that a lot of bands i always want to see is like one it's like when you try and describe their sound by the time you, it's like you're describing their sound but all of a sudden you're trying to describe another band sound it's like oh they sound like and then they use your bands like oh they sound mm-hmm. like atwood and they kind of have like that mixture in there. So it's like you're basically like creating your – you're basically when people are trying to describe music, they're using your sound to kind of describe something. Basically, you created something that is uniquely your own where people have to use your – just your style of whatever you came up with to describe something else. I hope we get there. I really do because it would be it would be a major success for us to be to be branded as unique. Well, again, listening to those, just I mean, I'm just kind of honing on those three songs just because those are the ones I really went through and wrote out really thoroughly with Ghost, Dance in the Sun, and Waves. And it's something was, it was like Dance in the Sun was kind of a mixture between Waves and Ghost. But if you listen to Waves and Ghost, I mean, you're going to get two completely different feelings from both of those <laughs> sounds and both of those songs. But it's something where you can, I could kind of tell after listening to them back and forth a couple times, like, 
trying to figure out, okay, is there a definitely like kind of like more of that bass sound there with more of like an alternative bass? Yes, yes, there, yes, there is. But then again, you can't just put it that way because there's so much more going on. It's, it's, it, you can't put like for Alan, you can't put them in a box. You can't do it. You can't put them in one style. It's just, I mean, if more people, if, if you're able to start getting, well, I'll put it this way, if we're able to start getting a lot more people listening to your music, eventually what's going to end up happening is people are going to start describing other people's music as, oh, it sounds like Atwood because your sound is so much different than a lot of other sounds I've heard. It's, it's definitely got that unique quality to it. It's just at this point, it's, you got the unique quality down. And when it comes to songwriting, I can tell that you're going to be bringing in more influences because you've got different influences. Your guitar player has different influences. And you're going to end up writing some things where all of a sudden you're going to try this, you're going to try this, you're going to try this. You're still going to have your core sound, that Atwood sound at the base of it. But all of a sudden you're going to have something that sounds a little bit more metal, something that sounds a little more pop, something that's a little more alternative straight, like just straight up. Something that sounds a little more electronic, a little more synth rock in there, some more post-hardcore, something more just hard rock. It might be anything. But it's just going to be something interesting to see what happens because you're like, can it, you're get, just with the way you guys are writing these songs, you're able to construct so many other different things around them that you're going to be able to hit on so many different categories. You're going to be able to get so many other, so many people listen to your music, but at the same time, the people that really like your music for the specific sound that you guys create, no matter what, in every single song, they're going to end up liking it because you have that, you ha- the bass sound that Atwood has is something that I can easily see sticking out in the mind of so many people. Well, that's nice of you. <laughs> Thanks. That that's really that's really some of, one of the biggest compliments we've ever had. Really, thank you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm really, really glad I was recording during that, that time. Hmm? No, I'm really glad I was recording during that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope we can manage to keep that unique core you were talking about. I really do. I don't think we're we're ever going to to lose it because it's the mixture of us that just creates it. But you know, I mean, you know, you never know. <laughs> and yeah, that's that's a thing where you never know as well. I'm going to use uh, asking Alexandria as an example as well because I mean they started out and they were much more of a just a metalcore band than their most recent album that came out uh, about was that a week and a half ago already? Yeah. yeah. And it was something like you listen to like their first two albums. I'm saying you listen to like a house on fire and just like, uh, what? Like it's, they're two yeah, completely it's different things. Much like Bermuda Horizon. Even though I think that even if you take Counter Blessings and you take Amo, you still get this, the feeling that it's the same band. Yeah, yeah it's they, like they, the, you, a lot softer, but <laughs> you just can't feel it's them. It's it's like kind of like they're that one most the like the most. Uh, standout part of it where like the thing that's like you're listening to their most unique perspective on it or most unique uh, part of their music is still there. And I think bring with bring the rise and it's Ollie Sykes for sure. It's you listen to the vocals and it's just, you kind of can hear it's like, especially on Amo as well. It's could I tell, was I a big fan of it? Not really. I put out there, I really didn't like the album just because again, that's just not necessarily my style. And I just didn't really like kind of the way it went. However, when it came down to Ollie Sykes vocals, can you still tell that it was Ollie Sykes? Oh yeah. Yeah. And then when they came out with their single Ludens at the end of 2019, that had a lot more of that, like, elect- it had more of an electronic feel to it. And that was, it was something where it's like, is this Bring Me the Horizon? Oh, yeah, it's Ali singing. You can easily tell. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was it was no different than anything yeah, else. I hope we can get to that. Even if we change it up completely, even if we try new genres and new styles, I hope we can manage to keep the core that makes people say, yeah, that's not good. That's not any- anybody else. And when it comes to changing things up too, I mean, that could ha- anything could happen to kind of cause that where, I mean, I'll use Asking Alexandria's example as well because I really went deep into that one. And the reason why they kind of went with more of that softer sound over that metalcore sound is because they didn't resonate with the harder sound anymore. They wanted to go with more of a softer yeah. sound because that's, you know, it's like they've been on, they've been making music, they've been on the road for 10 years. They're all in different places in life. They've gone through so much. They have families now. So it's just their perspective on life has changed. Yeah, so it's coming change. out in their music. Yeah. People change and so does their their taste, their style of music. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, if you don't like newer Asking Alessandra, go listen to the older Asking Alessandra. No one's obliging you. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, because I like in my review of that album as well, I'm like, do I like the sound they went with? No, but do I understand that they wanted to make that sound? That's the sound they want to make because of where they are in life? Absolutely. And yeah. I'd rather, yeah. I, as I put it this way, I'm like, I'd rather have them making that sound 
and making that kind of music that they resonate better with than making like one more album that has that old style to it. And all of a sudden it's just like, okay, we don't want to do this anymore. And then they hate each other. I'd much rather have these guys that have been, you know, making music forever together and enjoying their lives. I'd rather have them actually still doing that than to hate each other just to give us one thing that we want. I mean, it just, just doesn't make any sense. Exactly. You know, people have, just like we were saying before, people, everyone has their own taste. So we just have to roll with it. I hope our music gets appreciated. If it doesn't, someone is going to be to be liking it. Yeah. That's it's, it. In the end, you just have to keep making the kind of music that you want to make because, again, yeah. you're the artist. It's what it's your expression of what you want to do. Is everyone going to like what you do? No, not no one ever likes anything that everybody does. I mean, the most po- you, you look at the most popular thing in the world right now, whatever it might be, is, is everyone going to like it? No. Yeah, exactly. There's always, there's always going to be someone that hates it. There's always going to be someone that goes online and goes, I don't like this. Grr, something silly like that. But in the end, the metalheads are very good at that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's metalheads are very good at the, oh, a band got, oh, this band got big. Oh, now they suck. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Just because they're bigger now, more people like them, and it's not the cool thing anymore. It's like, come on. Also, it happens with a lot of music. It happens with punk rock a lot. Yeah. Like, punk rock is probably the most notorious. Because all of a sudden, a band blows up, and it's just like, hey, they got popular. Oh, now we don't like them anymore because they're popular. It's like, oh, come on, dude. It's, it's, it's. I'm like always like, if that's your kind of your case, I'm like kind of looking like, is that really? Is it? Is there anything else? Like, I, I, I get it's your opinion, but. Is there anything else? Come on. Can, can there be more? Maybe. But you yeah, said. Yeah, but but in the end, it's just it, you're the artist. You, it's, you're going to be making the kind of music that you want to make. And as long as you're putting your heart and soul into the music, you're putting your heart and soul in the lyrics. No matter what, there's going to be people that are going to connect with it. There's going to be people yeah. that resonate well with it. There's going to be people that don't like it as well. But. Yeah. As long as you're being genuine with yourself and making the music that you want to make, I mean, you're going to continue to love doing it every step of the way. Yeah. Yeah. I hope we can manage to, to get on that on the right track and do that. I mean, just listening to the couple of, well, the couple of songs that you have on Spotify right now, because I because you guys started back in when, 2018, I believe it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, 20, for, so yeah, 2018. <laughs> Yeah, so for a band that's been around just since 2018, I mean, you have the At Odds EP out then a couple like uh, the uh, Bury a Friend, Dance in the Sun, and Ghost. So on Spotify, I mean, oh my God, I should have uh, definitely rewritten my notes. Holy crap. I looked at, okay, monthly, monthly listener count, because when I wrote on my notes, this was a couple days ago when I wrote this mm-hmm. out. I, had, I, I was at 15,500 Spotify monthly uh, listeners. That jumped up 3,000. You're at 18,500. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Thank you. I, um, now I'm just like, dang, I should maybe write the, I should maybe look at the stats a little bit like closer to the podcast than a couple of days beforehand because, uh, I mean, I just talked about that and I'm like, well, the, the count was actually 3,000 higher than I thought it was. So the hard work is paying off. I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. From me writing this out, I, it was either on Tuesday or Wednesday when I wrote this out versus now, which is a shooting a couple days afterwards, and the count went up by three thousand. You gotta be kidding me! <laughs> what the heck? That's awesome. We're trying our best. We really are. Well, I mean, and with us talking about you know trying your best and just kind of you know trying to continue to grow, especially during this time. I mean, this is straight up. We, we just saw that right there. <laughs> okay, now this is awesome. I'm so glad I looked at that. <laughs> Alrighty, so I'm taking a look at the time right now. I've got one last question for you because we're actually almost at the two hour mark for this. Okay. Which I'm, I, I usually kind of, I'll put this way, I usually kind of go this long because that's just kind of how the conversations have been flowing, mm-hmm. but kind of like, you know, we're kind of, I feel like we're kind of getting close to like where the end of this would easily wrap up. So one last question for you yeah. and then we'll wrap this up and then we'll send you on your merry way to keep making great music. We'll put it that way. So, cause I've seen you released the, uh, the ghost, the, well, ghost, the single that came out this year. Basically my question for that is, can we expect any more music from Atwood going forward this year and into 2021? Is there anything else with going out with new music? I mean, if there's any like specific dates you have that you don't want to share, don't share them because, well, you know, 
you guys might have an idea of what you want to do and like, oh, well, we want to release stuff. So if you don't want to share it, you don't have to share it. But mm-hmm. do you have any uh, plans for new music going forward, even during this time of pandemic yeah. and uncertainty? Yeah, yeah, we do. During the pandemic, uh, as I was saying before, we, we worked on new, on new music. And so we plan on releasing a new AP by the end of 2020. Um, hopefully, you know, you never know how things are going to develop. However, we plan on doing that. And so, yeah, we're working on new music. I don't know if we're going to be able to shoot new videos or or stuff because of the situation. But yeah, yeah, we have new music uh, going coming out, coming out. I don't have any set dates yet. Uh, not that I not that I don't want to share them. I really don't have them yet. That's okay. So, so yeah, you, you can expect new music. That's for sure. All right, so all the, all the hardcore Atwood fans out there, that's got to get them excited because it's like, we're going to get new music by the end of the year. Hopefully, yes. Yes. So, so I mean, they're probably going to be dancing the streets by the time this podcast release. <laughs> At least I hope they are because now that would be awesome. Or Actually, no, not dance the streets. I hope they dance in the sun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. I was, like, I was like, I completely, I, I was like, I'm just thinking about that. I'm like, wait, I just completely missed an easy opportunity to make one hell of a joke or just like, <laughs> like a one hell of a, just a dad joke. But nope, I, I, I miss it. Now I got to go back and retract on that and just fix it because, oh my God, I can't <laughs> believe I completely forgot. I completely missed that opportunity or messed that up. Hey, like I said, I always mess up at some point during the podcast and that's my yeah. second, I think, for today. I, I messed up many times. So two weeks, fair. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so we're definitely on the same standpoint on that, which I'm a okay with. <laughs> well, all right, because I'm gonna take a look. We're right about that two hour mark, and I, we, I mean, we went through a hell of a lot today when it came to yeah. when it came to your I uh, was music, your style, uh, Ghost, a couple of the other songs, Dance in the Sun, and uh, even those uh, waves because it just blanked in my head right there. Mm-hmm. And then we really went through like a whole entire hour. It's like, okay, here's the is going out the pandemic, kind of what is going out. We talked through a lot of that. Which, is, I mean, I'll put it this way. I've been talking to a lot of bands on that, but every single time I talk to a band about that, there's always a little bit something different that went in yeah. there. And this one was the first time we really went deep into like, okay, when this is over, what are live shows going to be like and how our bands, and it's also with Atwood as well, how are your band going to, you know, make that so that when fans like, oh, you know, we can't do what we used to do at shows for a while at least. What's it, What are you going to do to make sure that they still want to come out to the show and still feel that genuine connection between yourself as a band and the fans as well. I, I had not talked about with that with anybody. And when you started getting on that, I was like, oh my God, we're talking about this? Yeah. Never talked about this before. <laughs> oh my God. I had to contain my excitement so my stitches wouldn't burst. <laughs> how, how, how is your stitch feeling? Are you okay? Um, one of them is like feeling a little bit tired now, but then again, I've been sitting down for like two hours. So if you saw me kind of adjusting like this a little bit, it's just to kind of make sure I wasn't like, but also a little bit bruised a little bit. So it's like yeah. after this, I might stand up. I'd be like, oh, this is kind of getting hard to stand up. But then again, that's just the way it is. Okay. <laughs> but I, but in the intro for this, I well have told everybody what happened with me. So they'll, they'll know it's like, oh, if I'm squirming around, oh, well, that's just yeah. the way it is. <laughs> Well, on that note, Alicia, I want to say thank you very much for being on the Core Progression Podcast, and also thank you so much for having me for having us. Oh, this 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 was fantastic, and also dealing with the fact that you know me trying to also like make sure I'm not like sitting around like sitting around like too much, also like not squirming too much because well, yeah, and also dealing with my silly mistakes of once accidentally stopping the recording on the audio mixer for like well, five you seconds. With my broken English for two hours, so you know. <laughs> Oh, don't worry. Your English was absolutely fantastic. You were oh. you, you were perfect. Don't worry about that. Okay. So the um have anything you anything else you want to say before we sign off and send you on your merry way to you know keep making more great music? Well, I think we've covered quite a lot of things, but I just want to say thank you to all of to everybody who's going to be watching this. If you want to follow us on Spotify or whatever, you can. You can find us on every social media you can think about. And nothing else, really. Just thank you. Thank you so much. All right. You're very welcome. And when I put this episode out in the podcast notes and on the YouTube video, because the podcast, of course, will be on YouTube and Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Uh-huh. If you look at the notes for there, I mean, all the links for all your stuff is going to be there. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Spotify. Where if, I, if I'm able to find some place where we can, where you guys have some merch out there. I mean, I'll put that out there so people can go buy some stuff from you. 
Yeah, there's. If you go on our official website, there's a merch section. So. All right, then I'm definitely gonna, I'm definitely gonna have one that's gonna be like, all right, their website. Then the second one, all right, this is where you buy their stuff. <laughs> and then also put in there, go buy it now. Thank you. <laughs> just just for fun. It. Well, we'll end on this, Luce. Thank you very much for being on the Core Progression Podcast. This was fantastic. And when you guys do release new music or when you know when the new EP is going to come out, if it's possible, uh, you could send it to me. Let me have a little listen early so we can kind of collaborate on something. So when yep. that music does come out, I can take a song off of it, have a song of the day feature for it, then we can kind of promote it that way, just add a little bit more to it. We'll just... Absolutely. So, yeah, let's make that happen. Yeah, thank you so Woo! much. <laughs> All right, and on that note, thanks for being on the Corporate Russian Podcast, and, well, we'll see you later. Yep. Ooh, well, 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 folks, that was my interview with Alice from the band Atwood out of Milan, Italy. And yeah, you can't really put them in a box because, I mean, they got that like alternative rock, pop rock kind of base, but they have so much more going on that it is absolutely insane. Plus, I, I've never gotten to a conversation with someone yet on the podcast where we talk about what live shows are going to be like after the coronavirus pandemic kind of is passing. We're able to start getting live shows again, but what bands are going to do and kind of the mindset behind it. She brought up a lot of great points, a lot of great things. And I honestly think that when it comes out with, they're on the right track with this stuff and I can't see what happens. Yes. When they come out with the new EP, I get to, I'm going to get a chance to listen to it and I will definitely let you guys know when it comes out because I mean, if you kind of, again, if, if you really resonate well with their style, which I think a lot of people easily can, and I hope they do. Yeah, this is definitely going to be a band you're going to want to pay attention to. So on that note, because my stitches feel like, oh my God, you got to get up and lay down or something, dude, not sit up because kind of getting a little crunched up in there. I'm going to be signing off on this one. So I want to thank you guys for listening to the Core Progression Podcast. Please follow Atwood Listener Music. You will see all the links for this up in the podcast notes and in the YouTube video description. But until next time, this is Kevin from the Chord Progression Podcast, brought to you by My Sunday Rock 2008. And you guys know how I end every single one of these episodes with a big, healthy, and hearty <gasps> See ya! Oh. Yeah!